non enigmatic music is a term that you hear a lot, and it's fine. My concern with it is that at the time of the term's invention in the 60s, it was a political statement about the state of those musicians uh, in their careers as musicians uh, in the, you know, in the, in the you know, just on the gigging scene, they're playing like rock and jazz gigs, and they wanted to bust out of that for their own music and get beyond idioms. They felt restricted by idioms. I had such a great time connecting with today's guest. He does so many interesting things in the music world. I'm Jason Heath. This is Controversy Conversations, and we are talking today with Mike Bullock, who is a composer, improviser, visual artist, and writer based in Western Massachusetts. And I love how the timing works out on these things. I was getting set to interview Mike, and then he appears on Deep Tones for Peace, and we talked about their recent initiatives on the podcast a month ago or so with William Parker and Mark Dresser, so you can check that out. But Mike, what an interesting artist, and I just had so much fun chatting with him. So let's dive right in. A quick shout out to our sponsors, Dorico, Ear Trumpet Labs, Practisma, and Modacity. More on them in a bit, but here's my conversation with Mike Bullock. I recognize that room because I was just watching your Deep Tones for Peace uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> from yesterday. So oh, great. Yeah, that's so cool. What what a, what a small world. I, I, I was just poke, poking around and then I was so very cool. It's great that you that you uh, uh, got involved with that. What a cool what a cool project. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. So I'm not sure how I first saw it. Maybe just from, you know, base Facebook. Yeah. Uh, various bass player friends. Um, I know, uh, you know, I know some of the people involved. Uh, I've known uh, Mark Dresser a little bit um, off and on and worked with him a little bit uh, at doing some telematic music. And uh, probably through him or just through several of the other people who I, you know, just, you know, Facebook bass friends. Um, and uh, yeah, it just seemed like such a great idea. You know, it's like it's so many people from different backgrounds and different areas of, of music. Um, you know, it's one unifying concept, the big doghouse, but, uh, but bringing together all these different, uh, people with different directions. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, no, it's a great thing. And it's kind of, it's cool how Mark and everybody involved, Mark Dresser, uh, you know, tie, tied it all together into the original, the 2009, I think it was, that telematic performance. Um, yeah. I think that's what he said. Yeah, 2009. Yeah. Actually, I was just listening to your uh, episode with him and William Parker uh, earlier. Yeah. So I, <laughs> if I remember correctly, that's what he said, 2009. Yeah, it's it's so funny. And, and you know, I, I originally reached out to Mark. Well, I've known Mark for a long time and, and, and it's been fun to uh, see him play live and and just I, I just love what he does um, but I, I reached out to Mark actually not about Deep Tones for Peace but I should have but about this uh, software jack trip that oh, right. uh, yeah. yeah and I don't know in, in the world you live in uh, I, I, is that do you have you experimented with that I'm just curious I have not tried that yet. I have uh, friends who have used it really successfully. I haven't tried it yet myself. Um, I'm really curious about it. It's a, I, I used another audio only connection recently with another group in Chicago uh, called Ninjam. Okay. Which is supposed to be really good. But yeah, Jack Trip, I'm hearing on these things about how many connections it can have at once. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a there's a few more things that have been coming out uh, as well. Uh, that it's like, it's it's needed. You know, it's been it's at the point where it's uh, it's not just it's the sort of thing that was really very interesting to people in, in like university yeah. programs, uh, and so they could have the back you know they could have the, the the back end for it. But now it's becoming we're seeing like. It's going to be necessary to be able to do this. Right, right. Hopefully one of the silver linings of this pandemic. Right? It's it's, fun, it's funny. I, I went down the Jack Trip rabbit hole, which ended up reconnecting me with Mark and then William Parker and, every, and Deep Tones for Peace. And now we're chatting. And I just saw you on it. So it's funny how the world works. But Gary, oh, Car- cool. <laughs> Gary Carr, of all people, emailed me about Jack Trip. He said... Jason, what is this? And I thought, if Gary Carr is asking me a question about something, I, I owe it to him and to the base world to like uh, to learn about it. So I, he sent me this video with Michael Dessen, who is at, at uh, UC Irvine and works on many things, uh, but uses Jack Trip. And, and the very first thing in this series Michael, uh, uh, Michael had put together was of Michael and Mark Dresser playing together like per, like tight. And, and, it, and it's interesting. I, I haven't put the thing about Jack Trip out yet. My... my 
conclusion right now is it's probably not ready for prime time for those who are not very tech savvy because you have to get into the terminal. It's uh, stuff that you would you would have no worries. Uh, people with academic background, I, I can't see my high school student that's just on the iPhone and nothing else. I don't see that. But it's interesting. Uh, Michael Dessen was saying that, it, you know, we rewind a year and there was one Stanford professor who did, invented that software kind of working on it part time. And now it's something like 15 people devoting time to it. And so it'll be interesting to see what comes of that. And I'd love to see something that I could just like clearly recommend to someone who has no tech skills, you know, yeah, like for sure. So yeah. is Ninjam, uh, uh, is, is that more like an, an app or a piece of software? It was, um, I, I only used it that once, but it was, a, it's a, it was a plugin. It was like okay. a VST plugin, uh, that I used in Reaper actually it's the DAW that I use most of the time, uh, but didn't use it as a DAW. It's just, it, it just, it shows up like a, as a VST, the way any other VST would in a digital audio workstation, but it's just for network connections. Um, you can also use it in Reaper if people are playing multi-track things from Reaper, but I just use it as a way to connect to these, um, to do this live um, duo and quartet session through an organization in Chicago that was bringing people together. And it was great. It was, it was a little, there was a little learning curve. So it took a little while to get started. There's some people who are having trouble connecting. Um, so it's not completely, uh, it, it's not completely plug and play there's a little learning curve but there's no like you don't have to go into a terminal shell you don't have to do any coding you just have to know how to like juggle the controls a little bit um, and then the sound quality is really, really good. Oh, sweet. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna experiment with that. That's uh, somewhere between what it sounds like you you need for Jack Trip and what I could recommend to my high school students who only know what it, what apps on their phone are and nothing else. So, okay, that's cool. I'll I'll do some I'll do some research. It's it's just interesting to see. Um, interesting anyway, because when I when I was talking and uh, you live in this universe much more than me, but like it was it was talking to Michael Dessen and Mark Dresser about this. That they the least interesting thing about telematic performance for them is like the latency issue. You know, it's just like the possibilities it opens up to be able to connect with people from across the the world. I'm curious where you are. In, are you you're in Western Mass? Are you in where where are you look? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm about uh, two hours west of Boston. Okay. So from there to Chicago, what was the latency? Because that's getting to the distance where that you're you're probably not playing fast bop to. But you're probably not doing that anyway, or maybe you are. Maybe you are. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> well, yeah, how was the latency? Not. Okay, how was the latency? Uh, it's it was hard. It was hard to tell. It seemed okay. It didn't stop us um, from playing, but there was a little bit of latency. Um, it's pretty short with Ninjam, I think. Uh, yeah, I was playing. It was uh, we were playing uh, abstract um, improvised music. The the, the, the um, artist I was collaborating with, this guy Norman Long in Chicago, works with uh, with field recordings and synthesizers, and I was playing acoustic bass, and it was, there was no, it, one of the advantages of playing a lot of um, experimental and uh, some free improvised music as I do, is a lot of times there's not a strict clock uh, yeah. tempo, uh, and so that, that makes things like this easier. Uh, it really does. It actually makes it really well suited because we don't have to worry about what a lot of musicians have to worry about, which is if you're trying to play groove music or really trying to keep together any clear rhythm, uh, the latency presents so many challenges. Uh, but for me, it does become a challenge if the latency is more than like, you know, I don't know, a third of a second or something. Um, so like I, I, I've had this project I've been doing for a little bit with some collabor collaborators of mine where we play together on Zoom. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just watch each other and, and listen on Zoom. Uh, but at the same time, we will both be recording yeah. the audio uh, using using some other, like a real audio recorder, whether they have like a Zoom or it's into a hard drive or something like that. And then uh, and we'll always start with a little sync at the beginning, like we clap and we sync. And, um, and then at the end, they'll send me their audio files with the syncs and I'll sync them all up. And there's always a little bit of flexible latency. I can see the way they, like it changes gradually over time. And I think Zoom's doing that all the time. But with, uh, with improvised music, it's not, it, it hasn't been a problem. So I've got a couple of things on my Bandcamp now that are these sort of distant uh, collaborations with improvisers uh, in different countries. And it's been, been super fun. And the results have, have come out sounding really good, I think. Very, yeah. very live sounding. 
This episode is brought to you by Ear Trumpet Labs. They make hand-built mics out of Portland, Oregon, and they have an excellent mic for upright bass called Nadine. The Nadine is a condenser mic with a clear, natural sound and incredible feedback rejection. This mic is a completely new design. The head mounts in between the strings above the tailpiece with a rubber grommet, and the body securely straps to the tailpiece with Velcro elastic. A 14-inch Megami cable connects the two parts, making it easy to place on any bass. It's durable and holds up to the demanding needs of the instrument while offering excellent sound quality. Ear Trumpet Labs is offering a free t-shirt just for Contrabass Conversations listeners with the purchase of a mic. Just visit www.eartrumpetlabs.com slash Contrabass to claim yours and check out the Nadine. How do you describe what you do? And I'll link up to your website because you, you lay it out very well on the website. But if you, if you had to give the elevator pitch, what, what, would, you, what would that be? Oh, wow. I'd probably tell people to check out my website. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Which they should I, do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I do, um, well, I do a few different things. Um, I, I am a composer and a bass player, obviously. And um, I also build um, electroacoustic systems. I, I do some electroacoustic music, but I also um, a, a building a wavefield synthesis uh, spatial audio system. Uh, so I compose in spatial audio. And um, and I also, uh, what, else, what else would I say? I, I've worked a lot with, in other sort of um, media arts, video, uh, intermedia arts, um, and, uh, and illustration, and, um, and also uh, you know, writing a lot about a uh, sort of sort of scholarly work um, about uh, about improvised music, largely electroacoustic improvised music. Yeah, well, I've been going down the rabbit hole on all sorts of different things that you read. <laughs> re- I, I realize how much I don't know about this this world <laughs> we that, that, <laughs> that we both live in. Um, uh, uh, so that spatial audio, uh, right? I, I was I was chatting again. This Jack Trip uh, rabbit hole I've been going down connected me with a. Uh, Somebody out here, or just south of here at Stanford, a, 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 a wonderful guy named Jan Stoltenberg, originally from Germany, and he is exploring, I believe, spatial audio. So just let me make sure I understand that I could move around in the space. Is that what, am I Am I talking about something similar to what you're exploring? Or? Sure. It, yeah, it all falls into a, the, the broader category of spatial audio. Um, and uh, yeah, there was that time that people were buying quad systems uh, for their homes, Um which I, I, we had when I was a kid, um, but uh, yeah, I, and Stanford is doing a lot of really interesting work right now. Some of the people there, Chris Chafee and his team, um, and uh, yeah. So uh, what's what's kind of been the, the the talk recently of spatial audio and spatial audio broadly written is basically creating uh, in in using speakers to uh, create a sense of space. Uh, within you know within a room or whatever, it's just creating a sense of space using audio. Um, so that can mean many things. A lot of the times, it means this sort of um, uh, psychoacoustic effect, where you combine signals from different speakers to create an impression of, a, of, of a, the sound of the sound source being at a certain distance or moving in a certain way. Um, there are different ways to approach it, but psychoacoustics is the is the most often model used. For example, stereo. We all listen to stereo. Uh, if you're getting a good, a true stereo field is psychoacoustic because you're hearing things in the middle that aren't really coming out of the middle of your stereo. Uh, they're coming out of the speaker, but your brain generates the sense of space. So, yeah. So uh, there's, there's different. There's lots of different methods to approach that, and. Um, what you're hearing more and more about recently in spatial audio is uh, binaural audio, which is basically using uh, encoding sound in such a way that when you listen to it on headphones, it creates a very distinct sense of as if you're listening through someone else's ears. That's become more and more important recently with the with the rise of of podcasting. People are looking for more and more ways to create a to, to do sound design and create an intimate sense in a podcast, you know, on their podcast, because it's, it's very popular and people are listening on headphones most of the time. 
Wow, that's super interesting. Yeah, because that's one thing that I listen to a lot of podcasts. I, I try to never listen to my own podcast because I, I can't. I don't. <laughs> I listen to myself talk enough, but but I, I find myself just getting lost in the in the conversation in a, a very specific way to podcast that I don't necessarily get through other. Okay, that's wow. What what an interesting what an interesting uh, thing to to dig into. That's a, there there are so many. I, I wrote down all these all these. Ter- okay, let me let me just ask you a few questions about things I was reading that I know so you'll have to explain like I'm five years old but uh, okay so self idiomatic improvised music um, and I'll link up to uh, the, the, the various various uh, things you've written and stuff on your website about that but can you just describe what that term means yeah that's a that, that came up with that term for my um, for my doctoral research yeah, right. uh, at RPI yeah which I, I finished in 2010 um, and that term I, basically I was looking for a way to talk about Improvised music, not all improvised music, uh, but certain areas of sort of free improvised music. In, I just wanted to know, I was looking for a different way to talk about it uh, in order to be able to get to different things about it, like the practicalities of it. Um, the music I was thinking of is very often referred to as non idiomatic music, um, which is a term from Derek Bailey, the British guitarist. I think he, I think that was his term. Uh, but anyway, non idiomatic music is a term that you hear a lot, and it's fine. My concern with it is that at the time of the term's invention in the 60s, it was a political statement about the state of those musicians uh, in their careers as musicians uh, in the, you know, in the, in the, you know, just on the gigging scene. They're playing like rock and jazz gigs, and they wanted to bust out of that for their own music and get beyond idioms. They felt restricted by idioms. So it was a little bit of a political statement in that way, um, which made a lot of sense, but doesn't always make sense now, especially for people who don't aren't gigging musicians, never were, maybe were never musicians with a capital M, and they've taught themselves to make sounds, uh, and they've only ever worked in this quote-unquote non-idiomatic context. It's, the music like that doesn't lack an idiom either. It tends to develop its own idiom or, or idia, plural. Um, so I, the term self-idiomatic for me, when I came up with it, meant like basically you, you're, you're sort of developing your own idiom uh, as an individual and from there becoming sort of interdependent with other musicians and your ensemble can become its own idiom that has sort of its own musical language and tends, it has its own tendencies um, and doesn't necessarily do every possible thing. And it's like, it does sort of like, like some groups will feel like it's playing the same piece uh, every time, but every time it's different. Uh, and that can be great. That can be amazing. Um, so I guess that, that's where I came from is I wanted to make it more of a personal, practical thing and take it out of the context of other musics. Uh, but then, you know, as I was defending this, uh, Christian Wolf was one of my, um, it, it was, a, was a guest on my committee, which was amazing because he's an incredible, brilliant guy. But <laughs> he said a couple of things. He said, okay, self and idiom are almost kind of the same word in terms of like their origins. And also, you know that idiom is the same origin. Uh, idiom comes from the same origin that means like a uh, sort of being yourself and being like unique, but it also is the same origin of the word idiot, you know? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. Yeah. laughs> but that's just, I've, I've learned that that's, uh, that that's Christian Wolf. He's like that. He's, he just likes to sort of get right into something and uh, he doesn't mind making you a little uncomfortable. I mean, he was great. It was, he was amazing, but it was really funny. It's so interesting to me. And this is, this is coming from a, uh, a guy who got a couple degrees in orchestral double bass performance and took a bunch of auditions and only through this podcast, even learned that people, I, ba- I barely even realized that people play jazz. That's how you know, Igra, but so, <laughs> so um, something from that uh, perspective is like, it, it's all, it's been so interesting to me to realize how academic uh, or how much academic uh, uh, depth or rigor or however you want to use there, there can be in something that when you just listen to it seems so free. And, and I did, I, that's something I've thought about a lot because, you know, talking to you or talking to uh, certainly Gaylord, Mark Dresser, uh, other people in that world, it's, I think like, oh my goodness, like Mark Dresser sitting down with him and looking at how he's analyzed the bass and all these divisions and getting harmonics and miking up the bass on the fingerboard. And then you listen oh, and it's that. like, woo, listen to this, you know, or like your music too. So <laughs> I, I, am I on to, have you ever thought about that? Well, it's, I, I was definitely in doing the, in doing my research, I was trying to, uh, sort of, well, something that really struck me about coming up in 
to free improvised music, which I still, I mean, I came up with that term and put it on my paper and everything, but I still say free improvised a sure, lot. Sure, Because that's the easiest one. Uh, but coming up in that, um, sort of, I, I start right after college, I sort of dove fully into that uh, in the scene in Boston. And then I ended up writing my dissertation about that. Because one of the things that was most interesting to me was people develop these approaches um, and they also develop approaches to talk about it because the people that I collaborated with, some of them were music school students. Like I studied, I studied music composition, and I was went to Boston to go to New England Conservatory for master's studies. So I had not totally straight ahead music education, but I had a, a lot of pretty straight ahead music ed, uh, but classical and jazz background. And um, and then there were other people on the scene who were like me, who were NEC students or Berkeley students or whatever. And then there were other people on the scene who didn't go to music school, but were like pro or semi-pro rock musicians. Um, so full-time musicians, self-taught. And other people who had just like picked up a tape machine and figured out how to make like an incredible range of sounds because they wanted to they wanted to control sound. Um, a good friend of mine named Howie Stelzer, I've worked with a lot, was really interested in like all the weirdest sounds he could find, and he figured out early on that he could do that with tapes and changing the, you could record sounds and then change them and control them. So anyway, it was this whole idea of this range of people who had all these different backgrounds and figured out how to talk about their musical priorities uh, by coming up with a new way to talk about it. Because they couldn't, we couldn't all talk like chord changes. We couldn't all talk techniques um, or music theory. Uh, you know, like Western music theory or jazz theory or any other theory, uh, we couldn't all talk the same like musical interests because we didn't have all the same listening interests. So we found all these other ways to talk about it. Uh, some of them were musical, some were artistic, some were like by way of movies, talking about movies we liked. Some was just, you know, a lot of it was just talking about, okay, what was that experience that we just had? And this talking about it, we've come up with our own way of analyzing things that helped us really develop uh, the music really far, so that was that was fascinating to me. That's like you could just come in there and you could be yourself uh, musically, or try as much as you can to be yourself musically. Whereas the scene, uh, the situation I was coming out of, I had really good experiences in music school and with different groups, but part of me, uh, as a bass player, was experiencing what a lot of bass players experience, which is, well, you're available. You own a bass and you own a car probably. So we're gonna hire you for that. And it's like, well, I wanna just play music. I wanna play music that's about me as a musician. Um, you know, I didn't, I was, I, I got I got kind of worn out on, on, on playing. I was getting like, I wasn't getting super, I wasn't getting like really super um, stimulating gigs. I was getting like gigs that I was getting called for largely because I owned a car and I was available. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I think, so we all I have think, to put up with it. Yeah, I think we all yeah. can relate to that. I think, I think uh, you know, me certainly. That's everybody always needs a bass player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's I mean, that's part of it. That comes with the territory. But I was thinking like, oh, what else can I do? Because I'm thinking like a composer after composition school. But all I want to do is play bass all the time because it's my favorite thing to do. So how can I do those things simultaneously? I think that was also part of it. How can I just like be a composer while playing the bass? Yeah. You know, it's so interesting that thing about the, the gig, the, I think I know I fell into, uh, I'll just call it a trap, um, for what you were talking about. Like, Oh, the, the, you, uh, you own a bass and have a car and you play well. And now let's going to play. And I, I thought what was going to scratch my artistic itch? Well, I like to play the bass. Let's play as much bass as I can. And I found myself wor like so many people working seven days a week and just doing bass, 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 all this stuff. And then I, I made a life change about, uh, uh, 11, 12 years ago, went back to school and the, and I, I thought I was, I didn't know what was going to happen, uh, especially to my own artistic growth, which I had felt was stalled out. And what happened was I got all those gigs where they were just calling me because I owned a base. They, they all left my calendar and the quality of what I started to do, um, it increased and 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 then I started to actually be able to scratch that creative itch and do a little more composition and arranging and all of a sudden I realized wow I, by doing less bass we'll say by playing I, I I'm starting to uh, I'm starting to actually tap back into why I got into music in, in the first place and it seems like you're you've been on that path for a while how the heck what, uh, what did you start on bass how how did you go how how did you get to where you are maybe just take me 
back to early roots in music and and just yeah what what yeah tell me about tell me take me on that path <laughs> so i started um you know i just like started playing piano when i was a little kid like so many people do your parents think it's a good idea that you try it and i try it i enjoyed it until i until i didn't enjoy it um and then i got i started playing trumpet in junior high school because i thought that was a little more fun because it was louder i could make more i could be more annoying um i wasn't really an annoying kid generally i wasn't like one of those like really like in your face kids i think i was really quiet but i had like this was my way to be like an annoying kid (laughs) trumpet you know kids playing trumpet can be really loud but i really enjoyed trumpet and i played it up through college um but it but I, i sort of lost interest in band class and had this idea from a friend of mine let's start a rock band uh, that'll be more fun. And I said, sure, what do I play? Uh, well, we already have a drummer, a guitarist, keyboardist. He said, you can play bass. I said, great, what's a bass? <laughs> and, he, and he said, this, I, I need to thank him for this because I, I haven't seen him in a while. But um, he said, bass is the one that gets the most solos. <laughs> 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 and by completely feeding me a line, he talked me into buying a bass. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> But then, like, I bought this bass, and I was psyched. And I, at right around the same time, it was we were about to graduate. We we're about to go into high school. We we're about to start high school, and I and the um, high school jazz band. I see a high school jazz band concert, and it's a big band, and 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 that's like the most amazing thing I've ever heard. All of a sudden, and it's like, can I? I can do that. I can do this jazz thing. This is incredible. And the band teacher was like, yes, please. We need a bass player. So from there, I forgot all about the rock band. And switched to upright bass pretty quickly because I was so psyched about that. So that's where that that was suddenly I'd almost quit music, and all of a sudden it was all I wanted to do. Wow, wow. What were, what were you? Uh, what were you thinking you were going to do on? So you, I'm assuming you were thinking you were going to play a lot of bass if you were so into it. What were you thinking you were going to? Did you have a genre in mind, or, or had you thought that far ahead? Or it was, a, it was yeah, like um. Like jazz, were you gonna play play classical, or you just knew you liked bass, or like- I, I knew I well, in high school I just loved playing bass uh, in in jazz band, but I was still playing trumpet, okay, uh, and then um, and enjoying just playing as much as I could, whatever, but mostly mostly jazz okay um and mostly like ec i was really into ecm records uh, okay was, like cool. me and this two other kids who were like super ecm nerds we wanted and and like and and like early ecm and fusion and stuff like that we were way cool. into that um so it was i guess in it's hard to say like i i i think i imagined especially after college i imagined playing more like um Uh, playing more like genre gigs but in college I was studying mostly composition and that's what I sort of pictured myself more like is a composer uh, who was also playing but by the end of college I um by the end of those years I was uh I I I found myself like my actual composition process uh mostly as I was working on my final thesis my process consisted of just playing things on bass not keyboard and writing them down but I was getting but it was more interesting to me what I was playing than what I was writing down I was getting more excited about what I was just playing and sort of improvising it myself it also happened that um my my teacher at the time Steve Mackey I was I was at Princeton and Steve Mackey was my um junior I'm uh, sorry my senior year advisor and so we would meet every week and talk about composing and talk about this like large ensemble piece I was writing. And every other week we'd talk about the piece and then every alternate week, um, we, every week after that, I would just bring my bass over and he'd get it as a guitar and we would just play. And it was my first experience where he's like, let's just play. We don't, let's not talk about what we're going to play. Let's, let's just, let's, we don't have to pick a song. We're just going to play. And that was my first time ever doing that with anybody. And that was like, and that was just half of our classes and it didn't go into what I was composing or anything. We just played and occasionally recorded it and listened to it and talked about it. Um, and that was like, and that sort of what led me to think like, this is, this is like, this is the way that I want to compose. I'm like, I'm thinking of myself as a composer, but this is how I want to compose, you know, 80% of the time is improvising you know, write some of it, maybe write structures for improvisers, but it's all got to feed into improvising. Interesting. Interesting. So what, what were you listening to at that point? Had you started to get into the free improv world or, or, or was that subsequent to that, that experience or how, how did that all work for you? 
a little bit. I was getting into, um, yeah, as I, in college, I was getting into uh, Anthony Braxton. Okay, great. Um, and Ornette Coleman uh, to a certain degree. Um, I found a Braxton CD because someone just said, check out Anthony Braxton. It may have been because Dave Holland was on it, actually. Um, so I knew him already. And, uh, and, and then I, I'd heard of Anthony Braxton. So I checked it out. I was live at Town Hall 72, I think. Um, and they have a version of All the Things You Are that's stuck in the middle of all these, you know, composition number 80A or whatever. Um, all these Braxton compositions. And then they slip into All the Things You Are. And it's the two of them and um, I believe Barry Alchul on drums. And it's just this shattered and glued back together version of All the Things You Are that's just like a mosaic of like the broken pieces of the song. And I'm playing it. And one of my friends says, boy, it sounds like you got ripped off. Because <laughs> it had been like a $25 import CD, which in the 90s was a big deal. Uh, and I was like, no, this is actually the best thing I've ever heard. And, and I was like, wow, whatever these, however these guys are like completely like taking this thing apart and putting it back together again, I want to know how to do that. Uh, and that wasn't totally, like Braxton is not totally free improvised, but right. he composes a lot and you improvise within that. Um, so I was getting that. And then... On the way, like transition from college to, to graduate school in Boston, I was starting to find out more, um, like a, the vocalist Sanko Namchalak. Uh, at some point after I moved to Boston, I found um, a CD of uh, Joël Leandre playing solo bass pieces, all like unaccompanied bass pieces. And uh, it's mostly composed pieces, but um, at the time I thought it was all composed pieces, but I think there's a couple of improvisations there under her own name. I just didn't know what that was yet. Um, okay. And that was an amazing moment because like, you can just play bass. You can just like play bass with nobody else. And that's like, that's enough. <laughs> so that was, that was a big moment. And like hearing her do that, I'd already been hearing you know, Dave Holland doing that and some others doing solo bass things. But that was a big moment. Uh, so following her name and finding all these other discs that were all just totally improvised music. Um, that really got me into, uh, and then a teacher at NEC said, oh, you like that kind of thing? It's this teacher who encouraged us all to improvise like crazy, um, said, you should listen to this tape I made of, of a, actually of a, um, a master class that William Parker did here last year before you got here. And so sitting and listening deeply to William Parker talking about how he understands the bass and how he sort of, how he conceptualizes the, the strings and the bow and all the different parts of, of playing bass. So that sort of really got me getting into the idea of, as I was hearing these people, it's like these people are doing exactly what I wanted to do, which is they are composers who are playing the bass. And they're composing while they're playing the bass. And they might write some of it down, they might not write any of it down. But they're composing and playing the bass at the same time. It's like my two, two great tastes that taste great together. It's like, that's what I want to do. <laughs> I want this to be like the center of what I do. And I still consider that the center of what I do. Um, even when I don't do it very well, and I don't have a lot of recordings out of that, but I still consider it like sort of the, that's the home base, so to speak. Uh, that's, you know, that's, that's where, that's the, the, the pivot point. Okay. Okay. Very cool. I'm not quite sure exactly what I mean when I say that. It's <laughs> sort, of, sort of an intuitive thing. I was like, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm so happy that my course, Beginners Classical Bass, is out in the world on Discover Double Bass, and we've been getting some great feedback. Here's Barry Green, instructor of bass at The Ohio State University, former principal bassist of the Cincinnati Symphony and author of The Inner Game of Music. Barry writes about the course. This wonderful, extensive course includes 14 chapters of 66 lessons varying in length from one to eight minutes each. It is so comprehensive. While it is called a beginner's course, this only means that the course begins with the parts of the instrument, including how to take the bass out of the case. However, it also takes the player through the most advanced left and right hand techniques, including shifting, pivoting, harmonics, positions up to the thumb position, tuning the bass, scales and arpeggios, as well as left hand techniques of dynamics, bow placement, articulations, including portato, staccato, and slurring. Barry, thank you so much. And folks, if you haven't checked it out, you can find it through the link in the show notes or just visit discoverdoublebass.com slash Jason Heath. Every day when I sit down to practice, I get up my phone and I boot up Modacity, which is my practicing companion. And I have a specific routine I go through. And here is Modacity founder and CEO, Mark Gelf on what he does each day with Modacity. 
What I do when I load Modacity every day is if I don't have a playlist constructed already, what I do is I go in and I think, uh, how long do I have to practice right now? Okay, I've got 40 minutes. Cool, I'm going to do five minutes on meditation, get my body state right. I'm going to do scales for five minutes and I'm going to visualize and I'm going to do this piece that I'm working on. You just set it up, see the budget, and follow the budget effortlessly by delegating that to the phone. Letting my phone do all those logging details has been so great for my practicing. I can't recommend this app highly enough. Love it, love it, love it. Learn more at modacity.co and we have a special offer if you go to our site for lifetime access to this app. It's so cool. Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Modacity. And then you, and then you, PhD, right? After that, okay, what did you do? You, uh, what drew you to do that immediately after? What was that experience like? And what you I wrote down what you it's a it integrated electronic arts, right? Which I looked up that term, but maybe uh, what uh, why why that specific uh, move for you? Yeah, my de- my degrees have weird names. Um, <laughs> the first one is just music from Princeton, which is not weird, but it's not it's not music composition or any particular yeah. area. It's just yeah. all of music everywhere. Um, and in NEC, my degree was in contemporary improvisation, um, which it used to be called the third stream department. Uh, so at RPI, which I started in 2006, so there was sort of a, there was a seven-year gap there. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, th- that degree that was called Integrated Electronic Arts just because that was the name of the department at the time. Okay. Um, so, and it's mainly the department there is, is sort of in spirit in a large way an arts department um, and uh, still is even though it has a number of faculty who are uh, music people uh, by, by background uh, and by degree. Um, and that's actually why I went is because I had several of my, uh, a couple of very old friends of mine um, had taught there, or still teaching there. Um, one of whom was a very a bass player named Curtis Bond, who's very influ- influential on me as a bass player and as, and, and just as a thinker about music. Um, and, uh, he and Tommy A. Han have been you know, friends of mine for a long time. So I, I went to study with them and to study with Pauline Oliveros, who was teaching there at the time. So um, it was really, it's, it was interesting for me because it was, uh, and it was difficult in some ways because it was an art school, very much so, uh, with, which has totally different expectations from music school. Uh, I was going there thinking primarily music, um, but ex- trying to expand. And I ended up mostly, ju- I ended up just talking about music. Um, making mostly making music and talking about music in my dissertation, um, but it was still very much an art school uh, atmosphere. So there's just different sets of expectations. Uh, introduced me to critical theory, which uh, was like really new to me and to everyone else. There was something they'd already done four years of in art school. Uh, wow. So that was that was a that was a funny feeling. That was uh, being thrown in the deep end there. Um, so uh, yeah, but I, but really, what led me to study there was the people that I already knew there, um, and sort of the, and and I know I I didn't really know Pauline yet, but I had met her a couple of times, and I had friends who had studied there with her, and um, that was a big motivation for me to, to to study with her and to study with the people that I that I knew already. It seems to me like the, where you're located, or just just to, I, I think of it as the Northeast. I know there's it's a general term, but it seems like there's a thriving creative, uh, free improv scene, or however you want to describe it. Maybe it's just because I've connected with a lot of people out there, and I certainly know Robert Black. Uh, not not that that's that close to you, but in my mind, out here in San Francisco, it seems close. Um, am I right on that? It seems like a thriving area for that, and maybe what 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 are some other areas? Uh, both in the United States or if we go, even go broader than that like where where are there some hot hot pockets uh, uh, in particular for for the type of music you're passionate about sure uh, though you mentioned Robert Black I just want to say that he um, when I was at Princeton he showed up and did a, um, com- a, com- a composer's colloquium for the graduate composers but I was kind of an honorary grad student they let me hang out with the composers um, and he just did it which basically meant that he talked to them about about contemporary contrabass techniques. And so he played a little bit for his presentation. I think he played part of Failing and a couple of other <laughs> well-known pieces. And that, for me, was also a big... I mean, there were there were written pieces, I think, mostly, but that was still a big opener for, like, it's just the person and his bass. And we're all, like, with rapt attention, all these composers, like, oh, oh bass. <laughs> <laughs> like, Ooh, wow, that's powerful. You know, it's so it's so funny. I'll just add quickly to that. It's so funny because Robert, he came and, play, and did a similar thing, and I think he played 
failing at Northwestern. And I remember looking around. It was the composition uh, for the composition department, but I was the only bass player there. And I thought, like, this this guy's famous. You know, he had that bang on a can, that r- record. Where is everybody? So anyway, but uh, I just wanted to throw that in. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He was even then. He was still trying to. I think that's changed a lot in recent years. A real, um, you know, bass players, are, of course, are interested in other bass players. But I think the getting other people interested and aware of the possibilities of the instrument, um, especially coming from the point of view, I, I would think, from the point of view of composers and performers of contemporary music. Um, that's that's still something that's always growing, and I feel like that's you know Robert is of course one of those and the leaders of that of trying to get people to, in, in the in the sort of Bert Turetsky vein of like well, hey guess what we can do it's like way more than you imagine <laughs> give us a shot um, so uh, but uh, you, you're asking about the concentrations of uh, like communities um, yeah the, the absolutely the Northeast but there's a there's they're good it's funny. The, um, there's, it was really good. Like I used to travel around the country a bit uh, for for this music, um, but haven't really done that uh, much in recent years. Um, but there's really there's uh, actually a strong uh, community in the Bay Area, um, and uh, as you probably know about, and then uh, Seattle as well is a strong community there. Um, they have the Seattle Improvised Music Festival on a fairly regular basis. Um, <clears throat> And uh, where else? Uh, Chicago was a big scene. New York, of course. But New York is interesting because it has its own... There's so much happening that kind of everything is happening at once. But there's also this stratification that happens. Um, the, of the scenes sort of like... They have to try really hard to define themselves. Uh, so that's what was kind of happening in the 90s and aughts. They were trying really hard to define themselves in contra, contradistinction sometimes. Um, but there's so, but there's still there's so much going on there all the time. It's just... it's kind of unbelievable um and then there's berlin berlin is kind of like new york in that there's so many musicians doing so many things all the time and but it's kind of like it's like it's that and yet it's completely different from new york because it's affordable you know it's one of the even as the rate even as the rents apparently go up there it's still one of the most affordable major cities in europe um and so i have a lot of friends who who've gone there from new york who are just like I want, who are like I want that constant excitement that I get in you know in, in New York and in other big um, American cities, uh, without the constant pressure to exist that they get in New York, Boston, San Francisco, even oh, more so. Yeah, <laughs> that's been so tough to on, on on all on the musicians that I know here, and it's 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 tough it's tough in any case. But when you're when you want to have the the chance to do if you if you don't have the option to take a chance in your art and try something and not have it work facing eviction if you don't you know not like uh, you know mu- not, I, i'm guessing you know the create uh, the the scene in which you're in you know nobody's expecting to get like a six-figure salary just directly from performing and uh, p- compiling things together in all sorts of configurations but man when the rent's cheap you got a lot of options and 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 it's you know talking to artists that have been here for a long time it's interesting those that have stayed They've they've got a rent control place, so they've got some sort of living arrangement. And I, I I've I've got another one of my crackpot theories, but like you know, the Northeast is has so much beauty to it, and so does here in the Bay Area. And I know I, you describe yourself as a field recordist too, so I know I I I I I love to think about the connection maybe between living in a place that just has a lot of natural beauty uh, and the kind of music that you do, or mu- particularly not 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 necessarily like what I was trained in orchestral performance. There's probably not that much, but anybody who's doing something creative, even like painting or, or cooking too, we can think of out here in the Bay area. But I, I, do you have any thoughts on that? On just the, 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 how, or maybe a better question is like, how does nature play into what you do? I, I, I'm guessing it does. Sure. Yeah. It's uh, interesting. Cause I, you know, so much of the, the, like these scenes, a lot of them really happen in cities, um, where people can be close to each other and venues can happen. Um, the area where I live is kind of it's it's kind of the suburbs, but it's not really sub any large herb. There's no big cities out here. <laughs> There's a, the city yeah. of Springfield, Massachusetts, which is not very big, uh, but it's a city. It's mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's um it's a lot smaller than Boston, but um, it's sort of a suburb of that, but it's a little more like country. Um, 
I went, there's a farm down the street, a couple of farms around here. It's technically agricultural zone. Uh, there's a bear that wanders around at night. Um, but it's not, but it's still, but you know, in terms of like population density, it's, it's the suburbs. Um, which is a big change for me because I was, I, I grew up in the suburbs, but then I was a city slicker for, tw- for 20 years in, uh, in Boston, Philadelphia, and New York, um, largely Boston area. And, um, so, uh, but the area where I moved to in Western Massachusetts, um, even though it's like a not densely populated part of the state, uh, it's, it's it's mostly small towns, and there's a bunch of uh, small schools around here. Still, there's um, there's been an ongoing and we're like pretty well known and well like respected uh, you know, experimental and noise and avant garde scene out here. That was always when I was in Boston was kind of like a sister scene, and we would go out and you know and musicians would go back and forth. We had and one of my bands actually was like it was seven Boston people and one person from this area, um, so there was there was a lot of connection out here. So it's it's there's a lot of appreciation for that here, but there can only be so many even before coronavirus. There can only be so many venues because venues are just hard to and even in, like even in the the sort of moderately big town that I live in, um, that has a little bit more of a city center to it, Northampton. Um, there was there were a bunch of smaller music venues that got gobbled up by one developer, and now they're all just sort of kind of the, the same sort of like like rock venues and pop venues and it's like some folk venues but it's a but it's kind of a it's it's a sort of a, 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 a been made a little bit um it's the word I'm looking for um it, it's sort of homogenized a bit um so that's like that's actually even around here that's that's lost opportunities for for special kind of spaces and now of course you know no one can have gigs or go to gigs anyway uh, <laughs> so getting, I really, really miss traveling, man. Um, so it's funny cause there's like this real, there's support for, for new music, uh, experimental music, even weird music. Um, I don't mind that word weird music. Uh, I put it in quotes, but there's, um, but, but at the same time, there's just not, there's not that many people. So making music out here, especially recently is a lot about, taking advantage of the fact that you can afford more space out here. <clears throat> like we have a house, uh, for the first time in a long time. And, uh, we can have our, you know, just having our own space makes a big difference. Um, it helps a lot uh, for musicians. Uh, and it, it, yeah, it helps a lot if you, if you play large instruments, but you know, it just it helps a lot to have a little space around you. So it's great to have some space. Has it been weird? Uh, to, cause, cause I mean, part of what I love and now nobody's experiencing this now, but I love that sort of snappiness to the city and going out and I can go to all these cool, funky bars and restaurants and music venues. And just that I, I, I'm accustomed to that pace, but at the same time, I could see myself getting accustomed to maybe a slower pace of life for a little bit more, you know, what, what's that, what's that switch been like for you? Um, it's uh, it's been really good. It's it's it hasn't been it hasn't been jarring. It hasn't been like negative, but it has been. It still surprises me occasionally. Um, I still like occasionally look at you know look at the place where we live and how much green we have around us and and hills and and quiet. How quiet it is at night and like I've got a house and like I it's like wow I can do this here. Um, so it's been a really, it's been a still kind of a surprise, but still, but a really positive one. Um, I, I really loved living in cities. I, I, but I, um, yeah, I, I love living in cities, but I think I really did need a change, um, because cities are just getting, you know, even when we were living in Philadelphia, which should be an affordable city, uh, there are neighborhoods that are becoming, you know, unbelievably overpriced while there's other neighborhoods that are either being neglected or just on the verge of being super gentrified and it's it's not a really great situation um though i love philadelphia it's a very interesting exciting city um but i I really felt like there was time to to do more like internal work like with bringing things in and working in a studio um so it seemed like a really good time uh for that and just finding a way to be able to sort of settle in one place a little more permanently too 
But speaking of travel, yeah, I mean, the travel has been that I have really missed, uh, you know, I, there were a lot like you, I'm sure there were a lot of things on the calendar that didn't happen. And I'm just staring out this window month after month. Um, how's it been for you? Uh, I'm, I'm assuming not doing much traveling or any traveling. I would have, how have you been handling this, uh, this period? Well, I, I do a lot of home anyway, but it's just, yeah, that was, there was, this was going to be a good busy year. It was just like started out with some, some good stuff coming and it was just like more and more stuff was on its way. And man, it just like, it just got bulldozed. Everything got bulldozed. Um, so I, uh, I mean, I've been able to do a couple of things. The, the, the good thing is like a lot of the, several of the things of mine that got canceled, um, have been replaced by online versions, uh, which was, which was pretty cool. Uh, so like there's a, there's a conference coming up that is going to, going to play at, but there's going to be an online version. Um, there is, uh, another, like sort of another workshoppy thing I was going to do a field recording workshop in, um, France that I was going to do in, uh, the end of this month that is going to be online and then it's going to be in person, knock on wood, uh, this time next year. And, um, and other things, there was another, there was a, a conference, um, there was another like a, a sort of field recording acoustic ecology uh, conference in May that um, I was on a panel uh, for discussing bat sounds. And uh, that ended up being a really successful online discussion forum. Uh, I still would have loved to just see all those people in person uh, and do it in person, but we ended up having a really nice sort of uh, global experience of these people coming in from all around and sort of you know following the following the sounds of the the morning sounds of the world uh, across the whole you know through the whole globe. Um, so it's so things I have to remind myself things that have been canceled. A few of them have been able to be sort of resurrected in this other form, uh, and it's also sort of, I think, triggered people to try to sort of reach out a little bit more. Um, it's funny, I was talking about that project I do with um, playing remotely and recording remotely, uh, improvising with some friends. Um, my friend Mazin Kerbaj, who's my uh, trumpet player from Beirut, who's lived in Berlin for a few years, um, he's been one of my favorite collaborators playing improvised music for a long time. And we would get together whenever we could. Like I would go to Europe, he would come to the U.S. occasionally, and we wouldn't see each other for a few years at a time. Um, and we'd just like maybe send files back and forth, but didn't collaborate on anything. So shortly after uh, everyone stopped traveling, um, we said to each other, hey, let's try playing on Zoom. And it went so great. We were just like, <laughs> he said, as he said, yeah, man, I feel like an idiot. I didn't think of this before. We could have been doing this for you know, a few years now. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it, but, but now it's like it's gotten us to play together you know, a lot recently. We've been, been doing a lot of that. And with some other people that I haven't seen in a while, um, I've, got another, I've got a trio with another friend, Ricardo Arias, who is in, who is in Colombia. Uh, and I've got a trio with him down in Colombia and me and my neighbor two doors away, a uh, longtime collaborator of mine, Vic Rawlings. Uh, so, you know, so we're wow. zooming like both down the street and, you know, to another continent at the same time. So, oh, how cool so is that? I would, so I'm not, I'm not going to be one of those people who's saying, hey, it's all good. You know, it's, it's all it's led to good stuff. But it's like there are these things like that. That's like, oh, the, the, the total disaster has a few things that people are like sort of struggling through and salvaging some things. Like, I'm going to get some good out of this like worldwide mess. Well, that's uh yeah, that's, that, that's, that's great to hear that, that you're, you know, it, I'm, I, I'm finding some of those silver linings as well. Yeah. I mean, long story short, I'm still bummed about all the stuff I had to cancel, but, <laughs> but you know, I'm not different from uh, a lot of people in that way. And it's been really tough for people who perform, you know, really, I mean, who, like like you, 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 I imagine you do a lot more, you know, performing. I mean, you do a lot of performing. It must have been really difficult to have so many of those th things taken off the board. Well, I mean, it's tough for everybody right now. A lot of people said I've been inadvertently preparing for a pandemic for years by like doing this podcast. And I do a lot of things in the music in industry uh, uh, for, for in various capacities. So, yeah, no performing and no, no. Uh, but but that was uh, that was a relatively small piece of the pie intentionally. Um, so, yeah, it's it's more like just the mental state of things. And, and luckily, my wife has a steady job. So we've we 
we're um, we're in a much more fortunate position than a lot of people. But yeah, it's been it's uh, it's crazy times, man. But but when we when we get back up to doing, do, I, I'm long overdue for a trip to um, well at least Boston. But 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 yeah, I'm sure our paths will cross one of these days. And yeah. it's just so cool. It's been way too long since I've gone to California, and I really I, I miss it. I, whenever I go to California, I always feel amazing when I get. It's like oh yeah, people talk about a certain California vibe. And maybe it's just my East Coast prejudices talking that we assume that California is chill. But then I go there. It's like, wow, it feels pretty good out here. <laughs> yeah, it is. There's a saying I didn't hear until I moved here um, that a lot of people in California are what you call ducks. They look chill up top, but their feet are going like crazy down below the surface. But, <laughs> but, but yeah, anytime, let's let's meet up and hang out. I'd love to. Uh, it, 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 and we, we North Beach is great and full of musical history. And we could go to Mario's Bohemian Cigar Cafe and get some get a sandwich and uh, uh, show Where's you around. That? And it's 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 just right around the corner from me. Yeah, all these old places, city lights, and where Jack Kerouac used to hang out, and all that stuff. It's uh, we're we're uh, just you know a half a mile. Oh yeah, from there's that. so much city and so much uh, so much history in San Francisco. It's incredible. Yeah, it's for such, sure. I mean, it's such a special place. Yeah, it, it is. Great. Well, I look forward to it. Absolutely. Well, well, Mike, it's it's great to chat. I, I'll link up to everything. Uh, anywhere in particular you want me to send people besides your website, social media, and the like. Um, um, yeah, that's fine. Uh, yeah, my, my website and my Bandcamp, which is just mikebullock.bandcamp.com. Mm-hmm. That's where most of my activities are right now, actually. Um, I have another project called Ears in Space mm-hmm. uh, that's going to get more updated soon. That's more like my field recordings and my spatial audio. Um uh, more like the technology side of things, uh, so that's ears in dot space. Okay, um, it's in my it's in my email signature. <laughs> Beautiful. But yeah, so those places, that's fine. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll set I'll set them there, and let's definitely do a round two sometime. Let me educate myself a little bit on the more technical stuff you do, and then I can. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> come, come with, but but I think it's super fascinating what you're doing, and I I, I I've I, I'll enjoy following along. And the, and the doors open anytime you got a project and you want to get it. You know, we got a weekly newsletter, so anything you got coming out, we'll give it a shout out. Uh, or if if you like, we can sit down and do this uh, anytime. So looking forward oh, to it. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, cool. Mike, you rock. MikeBullock.com is his website, and you can get to everything there. We've got his social media linked up in the show notes, and I had a great time chatting with Mike. What a cool guy. This is one of those episodes the Zoom gods were not looking kindly upon us, or probably me, <laughs> in this one. So we had so many dropouts, uh, but I think we I think we patched it together so it sounds like we had a coherent uh, kind of regular hang. Mike recorded audio on his side, and that's one of those things that I wish everybody did, but I, I never want to make talking with me a homework assignment for people so I, I just sort of meet people where they are in terms of gear so some of the audio is great some of the audio is rotten uh, and th- that's one of the things that I there are so many things I miss <laughs> of course about the, what I was doing in 2018 2019 but I was moving way toward in-person stuff which limits who you can connect with of course because you have to be in person with them but th- then I am so much more in control of the audio it's a better hang I get to learn more about them see a show that kind of thing so whenever we get out of this whether it's 2022 23 24 at some point i know pandemics subside and we can go back to uh normal and really back to normal i've been do, listening to far too many podcasts because it stresses me out about that but uh when that time comes i will be back on the uh, on the ground boots on the ground in different countries and talking to people in person and we'll always get good audio and nobody's gonna be able to make us drop out because there won't be zoom in the in the picture but until then we will soldier on using zoom or other similar products to connect with people and i'm sure the zoom gods will continue to be inconsistent with me but hopefully you didn't notice because mike recorded on his end i recorded on my end i stitched it all together uh but i it was like 
10 dropouts for this one. It was, it was crazy. And that's so, uh, it's so, it's, uh, it's, it's, but w- w- it's annoying, but once you get used to it, you just kind of manage and, and so it worked. And I don't know why I'm talking so much about this, but I try to just talk about what's on my mind and not edit these. This is the fourth of four intros and outros. This is the eighth of these little segments that I've done sitting here. Uh, it is October 29th in the morning right now. As I do these, I'm about to take my dog on a run out to the lakefront and I'm probably officially rambling now, so I will wrap this up. If you want to get in touch, if you have a guest recommendation or a topic recommendation, or you just want to say hi or something I should do a video about or 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 whatever, or let me know about yourself, feedback at Contrabase Conversations is a great way to get in touch with me. If you're not on our mailing list, just go to uh, ContrabaseConversations.com, our website, and you you will be you will see prominently displayed ways to get on our email list. Uh, we've got thousands of people on that list at this point which is which is cool and and slightly frightening <laughs> when i send out an email cuz i've i've i don't look through who's on there as a matter of course but i do know that there are a ton of prominent bass players people that i look up to some of my heroes on that list so it is slightly weird to write an email and know that it's going to these people that i look up to so highly but also uh kind of cool so uh join the join the club if you want to follow us on wherever you are on social media we are there and i want to thank the team who puts these episodes together michael cooper steve Hinchy, trevor jones mitch mori and krista copper mitch makes beautiful bases in the dallas fort worth area learn more at mitchmoring.com i am your host who is about to go for a walk slash run with william the dog jason heath and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum 